Hello and welcome to the Hormones in Harmony podcast. I'm your host, Vivian Allred, naturopathic nutritional therapist and hormone enthusiast. If you want to learn how to rebalance your female hormones, regulate your menstrual cycle and reclaim your vitality, then you are in the right place. Each week I will be delving into different conditions such as PCOS, endometriosis, infertility, hypothyroidism, acne and hair loss. Stay tuned for interviews with expert guests, Q&As and solo episodes that are all intended to help you move from hormonal chaos to hormonal harmony. If you'd like to submit a question for me to answer on the podcast, then you can email them to hormonesinharmony at gmail.com. The information shared on this podcast is intended for educational purposes only and is not designed to replace the advice of your health practitioner. That said, let's get into today's episode. Hi guys, welcome back to episode number 20 and today is another solo episode and I'm sharing with you the 10 steps to a better period because struggling with heavy flow, with cramps, with pain, with blood clots, it's just not normal, it's not right and you don't have to deal with it. These symptoms are really common but they're not normal and we've been taught in society that we have to suffer every single month and we have this monthly curse as women and it's just not true at all. Our periods can come and go without real problem, they can show up without any symptoms, it is possible. So I'm going to share with you my top 10 tips, 10 different things to focus on if you want to have an easy breezy period like me and it's not always been that way i've struggled with heavy cycles i've struggled with missing cycles completely and they've all from different reasons but there are some commonalities between each of those which i'm going to go into today so for me personally i think when i first started my period it was quite heavy but i didn't really know that at the time and it is actually normal for your periods to be heavier within the first few years of starting and that's because you're hormone receptors are actually getting used to the levels of estrogen in your system you may not be ovulating yet it's not common to start ovulating straight away it takes a couple of years and when your estrogen is trying to get regulated your cells are learning how to respond to estrogen at first they can be quite heavy and painful and sadly this is the time where a lot of people go on the birth control pill or start hormonal birth control to prevent this but it's actually a normal process obviously there are things that you can do to reduce the possibility of that and just make life a little bit easier but I think it's just a negative thing that we're just immediately told that there's a problem we're put on the pill and that's going to be the solution to all of our problems and sadly once we come off the pill we can often experience even worse cycles or even extra symptoms that hadn't even developed when you were a teenager so things like acne can start to appear infertility your period may not even come back so that's another side effect to be aware of and when we're on the pill it's actually covering up our fifth vital sign which our period is i think this was described a couple of years ago now by one of the big clinical journals they actually described the period as our fifth vital sign as women so along with heart rate, blood pressure, pulse rate, respiration rate, those other types of things that are crucial and critical for health, they actually label the period for women as the fifth vital sign and that just shows how important it is. So we shouldn't be trying to suppress it and get rid of it and cover it up with the pill. It's actually a report card every single month into our health. It's an insight into how well we've been taking care of ourselves for the one to three months prior and you may have heard last week me and Lara Bryden talk about periods if you haven't then go back and listen to that one episode number 19 and she shared about all of the wisdom from our period what it can indicate but she also mentioned thought it was really funny that if men had periods they'd never show up about it if they could ovulate they'd all be tracking and biohacking trying to get the best ovulation and the best periods every single month And I think that's how we should be as women, not in competitive aspects, but we should care about our periods and we should try and do our absolute best to try and get the best one that we can. And I think it it can be pretty simple once we come down to things. Obviously, there's conditions like PCOS, endometriosis, fibroids that can make things a little bit more challenging, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're stuck with these negative symptoms long term. I feel like when I lost my period for two years, so what happened was 
I initially lost my period due to overexercising and under eating. I think it was around the age of 18 at that moment in time. And up until then, so I started at age 14, my period was every single month, no real problems. Like I say, it was a bit heavy and maybe a little bit painful every single month. But up until age 18, there was no problems. And then I lost my period for about four months. And then I went on the pill, which obviously gave me a bleed, but that's not a real period. And I didn't know that at the time, but I do know, and that's why I talk about it all the time. Your brain to over connection is shut down that entire time that you're on the hormonal birth control pill. So once I came off after moving to a more holistic, natural lifestyle and being conscious about my food, I thought, why am I not as conscious about what I'm taking in terms of medication? I really wanted to find out what was going on if I was to discontinue the pill. So that's when I stopped. And my period didn't return for two years. And I think during that time, that was the that was the period of time when I felt the least feminine. So without my cycle, I just didn't feel like a woman, basically. Along with the acne and the hair loss I was dealing with, it's quite defeminizing. And it's quite a difficult thing to go through. Some women are absolutely elated when they don't have the period. But for me, understanding the female body and about health, I knew it was a sign that I was unhealthy because the role of the period is for reproduction. Whether you want to get pregnant or not, the female body is designed for reproduction. And if you're not getting your period, if you don't want to have sex or you have a low libido, these are all signs that your body isn't wanting to reproduce. This can be due to illness, nutrient deficiencies, thyroid issues, imbalances, and it's just figuring out what that is. But not having a period is a problem. You probably see all these health and wellness experts online, all these fitness influencers who are looking shredded and lean and really fit. But I can guarantee that the majority of them are hormonally wrecked. The hormones are in the tank. They don't have periods. They're struggling with acne and anxiety, gut health problems. So don't take a physical appearance as a sign of health. In my opinion, a healthy symptom-free period with no clots, A nice bright red flow is a sign of health, not a six pack. Okay, so on to the very first point. The very first step to a better period is to cut out the pro-inflammatory foods. And everyone is different in terms of the foods that we're sensitive to. Broccoli for you may be an inflammatory food, but for me it could be the healthiest food that I could eat. So there are some foods that we can't really say that they are inflammatory, but there are some that are the common offenders and they probably are inflammatory for most people. These are going to be number one, gluten. Even if you don't have any digestive symptoms, that doesn't mean that you don't have a sensitivity to gluten. And I don't think it's something that we should all be consuming on a daily basis or even a regular basis. There are some people who are fine to consume it on occasion, but just due to the research that's been coming out showing that everyone in a study was reacting to gluten there were just different severities in how much they reacted but everyone in the study had an azonulin increase which increased the intestinal permeability which is probably the leading cause of a lot of chronic health conditions and chronic inflammation so for me personally i'm sensitive to gluten so i don't consume it probably at all if i can avoid it but that doesn't mean you have to completely remove every single thing and never have it again. Definitely not. If you're going to have it, I'd go for organic. And if it's bread, ideally sourdough. But as a staple in the diet, so if you're having bread every single day or pasta, crackers, pizza, then this could be the a number one inflammatory food that you should avoid. The second one is conventional dairy. And not that I said the conventional kind. For some people, just any dairy at all. So if it's organic and raw, it's still a problem because it is a really common food allergen and sensitivity. The majority of the population do not have the lactase enzyme needed to break dairy down in the gut. Therefore, it can create a lot of inflammation within the gut. And also the hormones that are found in dairy, because it is a hormonal fluid, this can interact with our female hormones and be pro-inflammatory for certain people. I'd say especially those with endometriosis and PCOS, any type of hormone excess condition, dairy are found to exacerbate that a lot of the time. But even if you cut it out for a period of 30 days, I recommend that everyone does at some point in their life just to see if that's something that they're dealing with. 
So a 30 to 60 day elimination, then you reintroduce it and feel absolutely fine, no symptoms at all, then that's fine. You can consume dairy. I'd still recommend it to be organic and raw if possible, just so you are avoiding some of the environmental toxins that can be stored in the dairy. And the other pro-inflammatory foods are going to be things like trans fats, so processed packaged foods, foods with a lot of omega-6 rich fats. So these are going to be things like corn oil, soybean oil, sunflower oil, canola oil. You're going to find a lot of those in pre-packaged foods and meals when you eat out at restaurants as well. And I'd also say that refined sugar is a pro-inflammatory food too. So any white sugar that you'll find in cakes and biscuits. I'm guessing that a lot of you are avoiding those already, but certain times of the month we're more likely to consume them. So during the week before our period, the PMS week for a lot of people, that's the time when we consume and crave more sugary foods and starchy foods. And this can be a bit of a negative thing because that can lead to inflammation and worse symptoms during your period itself. So trying to refrain from that as much as possible. You don't need to deprive yourself of sugar or carbs if it's the natural healthy forms. Definitely not, but doing your best to keep your blood sugar stable, which we're going to talk about, keep nutrients up and just avoid some of the junk foods. Step two, we're going to want to increase our intake of anti-inflammatory foods. So foods can either be pro or anti-inflammatory. Again, this depends on the individual body, but there are some general foods that are anti-inflammatory for the majority of the population. These are going to be primarily lots of plants, different plants, fibres, different varieties, colours, antioxidants, just trying to get a range. Don't just stick with the broccoli, carrots, peas on rotation all week long because you're just going to get a very limited exposure to nutrients that way. Just really go for different plants that you never really consume, different fruits, different herbs and spices. Don't just stick with the same pink Himalayan salt and black pepper every week. Have a look at the foods that you don't tend to go for in the grocery stores or go to an Asian grocery or a farmer's market where you can find different plants that you've never really had before. And even just ask the people who work there for recommendations on how to cook it or just give it a quick Google search. There's so much information these days and the goal should be to get a wide variety of foods and just be as broad as possible with your diet because when we consume different fibres, this feeds different gut bacteria in our intestines. And the more diverse the rainforest is in our gut, so the millions and trillions of gut bacteria that we have living inside of us the healthier we are and low diversity of the gut has been linked to health conditions like type 2 diabetes obesity and also pcos if your periods are painful they're clotted they're irregular then omega-3s are going to be your best friend so omega-3s help us to reduce inflammatory prostaglandins so prostaglandins are hormone-like chemicals in the body that determine our levels of pain and inflammation. And the amazing thing is that the food that we consume can really influence the levels and types of prostaglandins we release. So if we're consuming a lot of the omega-6 fats, which I just discussed, the pro-inflammatory kind, that are found in conventional dairy, meat products, and industrial seed oils, then our inflammation levels and our prostaglandins are going to be going down the harmful, bad pathways. Whereas if we consume lots of omega-3s, the anti-inflammatory fats from oily fish primarily, then our inflammation levels are going to be lower and we're going to be favouring the healthy, good prostaglandin pathways. I do recommend you get that from fish in terms of things like salmon, mackerel, sardines, trout, herring, anchovies. These can be really good options. I wouldn't consume them more than three times a week just to avoid the excessive levels of environmental toxins because the oceans are sadly polluted these days plus wild caught fish is always better than farmed fish i would always try to avoid farmed fish as much as possible especially if you're dealing with hormone imbalances because certain levels of dioxins which are often found in farmed fish that can be correlated with increased risk of endometriosis and also inflammation certain herbs and spices and plant foods so fruits and berries dark leafy green vegetables these are all anti-inflammatory foods and particular herbs and spices like curcumin so the 
active compound from turmeric and also gingerol, which is found in ginger. These have had similar effects to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like ibuprofen in certain trials. So if you're looking to a more natural lifestyle, you want to manage your pelvic pain, your menstrual cramps through food, then these amazing herbs and spices have been used for thousands of years and we're getting back into using them again. I think they're becoming more recognized as these food as medicine compounds, but having a ginger and turmeric latte or using it in a curry or stir fry during the week before or during your period, this can actually have anti-inflammatory effects similar to the conventional medications. Step number three to a better period is to love up your liver. Our liver has so many roles in the body. I think there's over 500 different things that it does. And it is my favorite organ for many reasons. It helps us regulate blood glucose levels, immunity, energy, metabolism. It activates our hormones and it supports detoxification. So without our liver, we wouldn't survive. That's why it's called liver. So we need it to live. And we need to take care of it, especially living in this modern lifestyle because of all of the toxic exposures and burden that we put on our liver just from the world that we're living in. Even if you're eating a clean organic diet, the environmental pollution, the heavy metals in the water, they can all burden our liver and cause it to run sluggish. And it's true that our liver can detoxify itself. I completely agree with that. For those people who say, that we don't need to support it in any way, it knows what it's doing. That's true, but just the sheer amount of rubbish it has to deal with and the stress of the environment and the foods that we're consuming now, we do need to support it from certain nutrients, certain herbs, but I'm not one for supporting things like juice fasts, cleanses, detox teas, those types of things. I think it is really important that we focus on liver health on a daily basis. And there are some simple things that we can do. It doesn't have to be a big cleanse once a year. It's actually more beneficial to support your liver on a daily basis. And the first way to support detoxification is to actually avoid the intake or exposure of toxins as much as possible. This can be done through avoiding things like alcohol because alcohol is actually a poison to the body. And even though there's claims for some health benefits, especially things like red wine and people who drink live longer, there's actually not a lot of evidence and things that I've seen that support that. Especially if you've got hormone imbalances, most women do better without alcohol or keeping it at a very minimum until the hormones are a bit more balanced. And the way that it messes with your hormones, it actually increases estrogen in the system because your liver prioritizes the detoxification of alcohol before your own natural processes. So our liver helps us to activate and also eliminate hormones once they've been used. But if there's alcohol in the system, that gets put on the sideline until alcohol has been dealt with. So imagine that you go out for a big night out and those hours while you're drinking and the many hours afterwards, your liver's trying to process that. And for that whole entire time, your hormones and other metabolites and other detoxification systems in your body aren't focusing on the normal job. So that gets put on the back burner and therefore that can lead to estrogen dominance and other health issues if this process happens frequently your liver actually has a massive requirement for nutrients as well so if you ever google search the liver detoxification charts you'll see a phase one a phase two and a phase three and there's probably 50 different nutrients that's needed for that nutrient deficiencies don't tend to occur alone so if you're lacking in one thing you're probably lacking in a handful of different nutrients And therefore, there's going to be many different pathways, many different processes that aren't functioning optimally. And therefore, that can lead to problems and symptoms throughout the whole entire body, but particularly the hormone system. Because once hormones are used, they do need to be eliminated from the body. If not, they can be recirculated and this can cause dominance in that hormone and problems with PMS, breast tenderness clotted periods, pain, and also high androgen symptoms like PCOS symptoms. Amino acids are also crucial for phase two of this detoxification. So once your body processes a toxin, this can be a natural toxin made from your body or an environmental toxin that's created outside your body, then it goes through phase one. And this helps to break it down slightly and make it water-soluble 
but during this intermediate phase it actually becomes really quite toxic therefore we need phase two to run straight away and get this toxin out of your body as soon as possible a lot of people are fast phase one metabolizers but slow phase two metabolizers so i like to give the analogy of cleaning out the bins in your home so imagine it's bin day you're emptying your bins take all the different bins in your house and you empty them into one big bin ready to take outside that would be phase one detoxification Phase two would be you taking that single bin out to the back of your house or the front of your house, ready for the bin men to come along and take it away. That's phase two. Phase three is when the bin men come and take that away, and that would be the toxins leaving your body through the bowel or through the urine. And problems can occur at any part of that phase, but the most common one is there's just too much trash, so there's too much coming in phase one, and your house is flooded with rubbish and you can't get it out to the the front of your house or the back of your house quick enough. So I hope that analogy makes sense, but it's just a sign to show that there are different phases of detoxification for those people who are just doing a juice fast or a cleanse, just drinking vegetable juices or fruit juices, then they're only giving their body a handful of different nutrients. And they're actually lacking a lot of the time in amino acids, which are needed for that phase two detoxification. So taking all of the rubbish out to the sidewalk for you to leave it for the bin men to come. Amino acids are found in protein. So high quality protein, plant protein does contain some, but you do need to be really careful and make sure that you're getting enough in your diet in the right quantities and proportions. So that's why I'm such a big fan of high quality animal protein maybe once to three times a day i'm fine with that obviously we use it as a condiment so we're not making it the star of the meal we're using plant foods first being the primary staple on the plates but then i also use animal protein to get in some of these amino acids and other crucial nutrients for hormone health like zinc and iron herbal teas can be a great way to get in some liver supported medicinal benefits as well so on my last solo podcast, I think it was, I did my 10 steps to hormonal harmony and herbal teas are a big part of my day. I like to just brew them all day long, sometimes have them cold when it's summertime. I brew multiple tea bags at once just to get in some extra benefits. So the best ones for liver health and detoxification are going to be dandelion, nettle, burdock, green tea and milk thistle. Next, we want to support your gut health. Gut health is so important for every single system in the body, but particularly the hormone system. It's actually where a lot of hormones are created and the nutrients needed for hormone production are also absorbed in this, hopefully. If we have inflammation in the gut, if we have chronic gut infections with things like parasites, yeast, candida, H. pylori, then this can lead to intestinal permeability. So you've probably heard of this known as leaky gut. And leaky gut has been linked to many different hormone conditions, but also chronic diseases like cancers, neurological diseases, autoimmunity. And this is because it leads to systemic inflammation and immune activation. So when your immune system's on overdrive, this can lead to certain health conditions. But over time, your immune system then becomes depleted. And that's when it can lead to some of the more chronic illnesses. Conditions like PCOS and endometriosis have been linked to poor gut health as well and this intestinal permeability. In PCOS, it's because the inflammation can lead to insulin resistance and adrenal stress, so they're two of the biggest drivers of PCOS. And in endometriosis, certain bacteria contain outer membranes that produce a toxin called LPS. So if you have an overgrowth of certain bacteria, this can lead to inflammation in the entire system. And that's a big driver of endometriosis. There's actually a correlation between the amount of LPS in the system, lipopolysaccharide, and severity of endometriosis. If you're constipated or you have an overgrowth of bacteria in the large intestine, when I was mentioning about phase three of liver detoxification, so all the bins in your home have been emptied, everything's ready to go and go to the tip. Your liver packages it up, your excess hormones like estrogen and progesterone, it packages it up in a nice little box, puts a bow on it and sends it to the bowel to be eliminated through your stool. If there's an overgrowth of bacteria that produce an enzyme called beta-glucuronidase 
or you're constipated so it's sitting in the bowel for too long, these bacteria can actually work and unpackage that box and let estrogen recirculate in the system. This is a really common factor that I see contributing to estrogen dominance. So remember in estrogen dominance, we can have excess levels of estrogen from environmental exposures, from our fat cells. So if we're too fat or overweight, then our own body can produce just too much estrogen. But we can also have estrogen dominance just due to low progesterone. So there are the two mechanisms with that. And I find that the gut link is a big connection. If someone's dealing with estrogen dominance, I always investigate gut health. Again, it's different for everyone, but there's certain foods that are beneficial for gut health in a lot of people. And there are certain foods that are detrimental to gut health. So there's some of the ones to the pro and anti-inflammatory foods. But I also like to recommend people who are suffering with digestive issues to focus on foods that are easier to digest. So staying away from raw foods, things like grains, unsoaked beans and lentils, just really high fiber irritating foods. I tend to reduce them and focus on more easy to digest, warming, pre-digested foods like soups and stews, smoothies, and really limiting or avoiding completely raw salads and unsoaked nuts, things like that. Bone broth can be really additional to add in as well because it contains different amino acids like glycine and proline, which are really helpful at rebuilding the gut barrier. So if it is damaged and you've got some intestinal permeability going on, bone broth can be amazing to add in. One side note though is a small percentage of the population can't actually tolerate bone broth. Similarly with fermented foods, they can be great for a lot of people. So try and include those if you can. If you do find that you're reacting to them in terms of headaches or itchy skin, breakouts, anxiety, palpitations, irritability, then you could have a histamine intolerance. And I've been talking about that over the past couple of weeks, the connection between histamine and your hormones, because histamine is a natural component of our immune system. So when we're inflamed or we have an infection or our body senses threat, then our mast cells actually reduce actually produce histamine from the immune system and this can cause swelling vasodilation and itchiness but this histamine can actually stimulate estrogen and it works the other way around so estrogen can actually stimulate histamine so just be wary when introducing some of these gut healthy foods particularly fermented foods and bone broth collagen can be one too but for the majority of people try to consume them and you should be pretty fine with them Step five to a better period is to avoid toxins. Again, a lot of them are from the environment. Our body does create toxins. So the word toxin doesn't just mean something outside of our body. Our body produces internal toxins all day, every day, but it's the environmental man-made ones that are really the problem. There's just so many thousands of chemicals introduced into the environment every single year. And a lot of them have never been tested for the safety of exposure to humans. The skincare and makeup industry is particularly bad at this. They may test one or two ingredients, but a lot of them aren't tested or regulated at all. And they never test the synergistic effects of all of these ingredients in one product. So one ingredient may show that it's fine to use on your skin, but they don't consider the toxins in your water, the pesticides on your food, the other 50 ingredients in that product, all combining and interacting at the same time. So the combination and the just sheer amount of toxins you're exposed to is also very important. Certain chemicals in skincare products and in the environment are known as endocrine disrupting chemicals. That's because they can enter the bloodstream either through our skin or through the food that we consume, and they can actually mimic our hormones. So our endocrine system is our hormonal system, and they can mess and interfere with our own natural hormone production, particularly actions of estrogen. So they can sit in the receptor site of estrogen where it should the natural hormone should go and they can stimulate it or prevent our own natural hormone from sitting in that receptor site and having the actions that it's meant to. And long-term exposure has been linked to things like breast cancer, hormone-dependent cancers, infertility, PCOS. So avoiding them isn't just going to be beneficial for your hormones and your period health. It's going to be beneficial for your whole entire body and future health too especially if you're wanting to have children or you currently have children, the exposures that children are exposed to in utero, so while you're pregnant with them or when they're under the age of, I'd say, 15, 
that's a really crucial time to make sure you're avoiding them as much as possible because exposures at that time can actually lead to health conditions and fertility problems in the future as well. The biggest exposures we have are from pesticides in non-organic foods. So opting for organic as much as possible. And I understand that not everyone can afford that. So just sticking with the dirty dozen and clean 15. I speak about it all the time, but the Environmental Working Group is a really good resource for this. So check that out if you haven't already and just buying the foods organic that are really necessary and the ones that aren't heavily sprayed, you can get away with non-organic. Skincare, like I mentioned, so if you're doing really well with your diet, eating all organic foods, you're exercising, but you're still using conventional beauty products on your skin, then that can be having a detrimental effects to your hormones. So a lot of makeup brands contain these endocrine disrupting chemicals, but also things like heavy metals. Menstrual care products are also very important. And I find that the women that I work with, when they switch out conventional tampons and pads to either organic sanitary products or even menstrual cups, which I'll get onto a lot of the time, the menstrual cramps, the periods actually improve. And the reason is a lot of the time that the cotton used in conventional brands like Tampax is often heavily sprayed. Cotton's one of the highest sprayed crops in the world, along with coffee. So you can imagine putting something that's laden in pesticides that also bleach to give them that lovely white, clean looking appearance. And the bleach that they use contains chlorine and dioxins as well. So that's another two chemicals that we want to minimize as much as possible. And some of these chemicals have been linked to poor egg quality in animals, and like I mentioned, the, there's a big link between hormone conditions, specifically endometriosis and PCOS, with some of these environmental toxins. Next is the use of supplements and superfoods to help you have a better period. The foundations are diet and lifestyle, hydration, stress management and sleep. We all know this, but the power of supplements and some certain superfoods and products can be very helpful especially if you've got to the point where you've covered everything that you can and you're still stuck. I think the foundational supplement protocol I'd like to recommend for most people would be some sort of multivitamin or methylated B-complex. And I don't mean just the general B-complex that you can pick up at the local shop or the local pharmacy. They're just not going to be effective, but it needs to be methylated. If your supplement contains folic acid as folate so look on the ingredients on the back if it contains folic acid that's actually not a bio bioavailable form of the nutrients and that's a sign that it's a synthetic supplement that you're taking so ideally we want to see methyl folate on the back or folate in the place of folic acid that's a sign that it's a better quality supplement other ones are magnesium that's going to help with menstrual cramping probiotics that's going to help your gut health so you can either do this through the fermented foods if you can tolerate that. But for people like me who can't, then a probiotic supplement can work too. And that's going to help the gut health aspect and just keep any bad bacteria in check and keep your immune system strong. And also, I think everyone can benefit from some sort of stress support just because of the environment that we're living in. So magnesium can help to do that. But other things like adaptogens whether that's ashwagandha rhodiola tribulus this can all help to just support our nervous system because when our nervous system stressed then that can actually throw off our, our hormones which we're going to discuss next for more specific period hacking tools we can use things like vitex this tends to be most beneficial for those with high prolactin so on a blood test if you're showing high prolactin then vitex may be very helpful um, also with amenorrhea, so if you're dealing with amenorrhea, not from PCOS, a lot of the time if you have PCOS you have high LH, so check that first before you start supplementing with Vitex because Vitex can actually raise LH and can lead to worsening of PCOS symptoms. So if you're dealing with amenorrhea from another cause, maybe thyroid issues or hypothalamic amenorrhea, then Vitex can be helpful. If you've come off the pill, then I would recommend waiting three months before supplementing with Vitex. But you can definitely use that to help you get your period back post pill. Maca can be helpful. Again, it can raise certain hormones like estrogen and androgens in certain people. So it's not for everyone. I usually recommend it for those transitioning into perimenopause. So when 
progesterone and hormones are dropping slightly testosterone's reducing it can help with certain symptoms there like hot flashes and low libido vaginal dryness but for those already in like a hormone dominant state it's usually not the best evening primrose oil can help with pms particularly breast tenderness it tends to be very helpful for and similarly sometimes people benefit from the acne supporting aspects Vitamin C can be helpful at supporting progesterone production during the luteal phase. So after you ovulate, you produce progesterone. And this is the progestation, so pro-pregnancy hormone. And even if you don't want to get pregnant right now, you want to be producing a ton of progesterone just because of the benefits that it can produce. And if you're experiencing a wonky cycle or PMS symptoms, then it's likely that your progesterone is low and that's what's contributing to your symptoms. Zinc can also be very useful just for female hormones in general, particularly PCOS, because it helps to regulate and kind of control androgen levels and excessive sebum production in the skin. So if you're someone who's dealing with very oily skin or acne prone skin, hair loss, thyroid issues that are leading to hormone imbalances and period problems, then zinc may be a good inclusion. Obviously starting with zinc rich foods first, so they're going to be red meat, seafood, Oysters are a really good source. And if you're supplementing for long term or in high doses, then I do recommend supplementing with a copper complex as well. So zinc with a little bit of copper in there will help to keep those two nutrients in ratio. One final nutrient that could be really helpful, especially if you're dealing with very heavy periods, is iron. And it may sound a bit counterintuitive but heavy periods can actually be caused by an iron deficiency and I used to think that it would do the opposite so if you had high iron that would lead to heavy periods but it's actually the opposite way around and it can be a vicious cycle so you have a heavy period you deplete iron and then you because you have low levels of iron you have a heavy period so you do need to intervene somewhere food is first so again, red meat, organ meats are fantastic at supporting your iron levels and increasing absorption of iron. So please start there, but you can always turn to a supplement as well. But ideally, that's not the long-term solution. We need to find out why your iron levels are so low. Is it because you're not eating any iron-rich foods in your diet? Or is it because you're dealing with a chronic gut infection and the pathogens are stealing the iron or you're not absorbing the iron that you are consuming? Step seven is to manage your stress. Your body prioritizes stress, so a life and death situation, over the quality of your period and if you struggled with PMS symptoms that month. It doesn't really care as long as you're safe and healthy and well. You may have heard of the term pregnenolone steal, so your brain steals nutrients and hormones away from progesterone production and sends it to stress hormone production instead. That isn't exactly true. Your body doesn't steal the hormones, but it works in a different way. So definitely when you are stressed and you've got high stress hormones circulating, it's your brain that actually shuts down the reproductive function. It can prevent you ovulating, it can delay ovulation, or it can just take your period completely away anyway. Or it can just stop your periods completely. People have experienced loss of period due to stress or maybe a particularly stressful month that you had, your period didn't come at all. And that's known as hypothalamic amenorrhea. So your brain, your hypothalamus, is actually shutting down your reproductive function for a protective mechanism. And if you're not ovulating, you're not producing progesterone, which is our anti-anxiety hormone. It helps to counteract some of the negative effects of estrogen. So we're in a more estrogen dominant state. And that's usually the reason why people are dealing with PMS is because of low progesterone or no progesterone at all. So I know that we always hear of the benefits of meditation and yoga and mindfulness, but for some people, they just don't work at all. It actually makes them more stressed. So the important thing is to find out something that works for you and gets you in that flow state. And I recently listened to a podcast with one of my college lecturers and lecturer for Bioca, some of the CPD events that I attend, Alessandro Ferretti, and he talked about how he was working with his clients, finding and tracking the the heart rate variability so that's an indication of stress and some people when he asked them to do meditation the stress was just through the roof whereas if they were doing something that they love so one of his clients was washing a car his heart rate variability increased so that's a sign of stress reduction it's a bit counterintuitive but 
um, high HRV is reduced stress. So when this client was washing his car, he was in a relaxed healing state. So it's finding out what works for you, whether that's an Epsom salt bath, having coffee with a friend, whether that's going on a 20 minute run, walking in nature, dancing, singing, doing a yoga class, it could be anything, but I can't really tell you what works for you. The only caveat is to make it technology free if possible. Just trying to get away from your phone or your laptop or the TV. So even though you may feel stress reduced when you're watching Downton Abbey on TV, there are other things that you could be doing to actually support your body a bit better and just trying to get away from the the technology. If you can do it outside in nature, that's even better because you're getting the benefits of nature, sunlight, fresh air as well. So one of my favourites is a nice walk outside, listening to music, listen to an audio book or podcast or just doing some positive affirmations in my head and doing some positive mental thinking at the same time. Step eight, we want to manage our blood sugar so that we can have a better period. The actual main role of our endocrine system, so our hormone system, is to provide fuel and nutrients and glucose to the brain. If its primary job is not covered, if it's not doing that correctly, then we can't expect all of the other functions in our reproductive function and our sex hormone balance to be working optimally. When we have spikes or crashes in blood glucose too frequently, whether that's from stress, eating too many refined carbohydrates, not enough protein or fibre, this can lead to spikes in stress hormones, and we've just spoken about the impact of stress, it can also produce inflammation, and long term can lead to insulin resistance. So with women with PCOS are especially at risk of this and often 70% of women with PCOS have some degree of this insulin resistance going on and long term this can lead to pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes. So my favourite ways to stabilise and balance your blood sugar levels is to remove and avoid the processed foods that I mentioned, so the pro-inflammatory foods, the refined sugars, that doesn't mean going low carb and keto, definitely not, actually going too low carb can actually lead to insulin resistance and actually increase your blood sugar levels because your stress hormones are increasing. But if you are choosing carbohydrates, going for the starchy complex carbohydrates, pairing that alongside some high quality protein, healthy fats and plant fiber as well. Avoid snacking if possible because the more that you snack, the more that your body is going to produce insulin and you're just putting an extra load on your digestive system. So I like to stick to three square meals every single day with a source of the protein, fibre and fat at every single meal and just sticking with real whole foods. We don't really have to make it complicated. If you could kill it, pick it from a tree, grow it from the ground, then it's probably good for you. If it's made in a lab, then probably not. Step nine to a better period is to sleep well every single night. Getting seven to nine hours of high quality sleep every single night is going to be one of the best ways to get your hormones and your period back on track. When we're not sleeping, when we're sleep deprived, then that's going to affect our energy the next day. It's going to affect our mood, our cravings, our appetite. It's going to make us more inflamed and more insulin resistant. So I've just mentioned about the blood sugar. One night of sleep deprivation that was classed as less than six hours of sleep actually impaired insulin sensitivity. So it made them more insulin resistant by 33%. So can you imagine what five years, 10 years, two decades of poor sleep is going to do to your hormones. That's why I'm so obsessed with sleep. I use sleep tracker. I tape my mouth at night. If you want to know why, then you can check out my blog post about how it transformed my sleep. I use blackout curtains. I use a light box in the morning that wakes me up with natural sunlight. I wear earplugs and eye mask. And this gives this gives me the best sleep that I've ever had. And that's definitely reflected in my hormones and my skin, in my PCOS symptoms, everything is improved. So I'd rather you sleep in and have an extra two hours of sleep in the morning than wake up at four or five AM to hit the gym. Working on your evening routine can help this if you're someone who can't fall asleep at 10 30 PM, that's the optimal time between nine and ten PM ideally. If you're someone who just can't get to sleep at that time or has difficulty falling asleep or staying asleep, then you should look into your sleep hygiene routine. And I have a blog post on this on my website and a free download. So my sleep hygiene download on the the section of my website, you can check that out for free. And it just talks about the importance of circadian rhythm. So our light and dark cycles, 
why it's so important to live in sync with natural light and dark. So in the daytime, we should be up and about. We shouldn't be lying in bed till 10 o'clock in the morning. And similarly, in the evening, we want to shut down all the blue light coming from technology. We just want natural moonlight, light in the room or candles, Himalayan pink salt lamps, and maybe wearing some blue light blocking glasses. Even though that may not seem that it's going to even affect your period at all, it absolutely is because your period is affected by your hormones and your hormones are controlled by the rhythms of the earth. That's why a lot of women have menstrual cycles that are on average 28 days. That's the exact same as, as the moon cycle. That's why we all go into menopause or start our periods around the same time because it's all determined with the light and dark cycles of the earth. My 10th and final step to a better period is to sync with your cycle. If you've been following me on Instagram or my website, you may have heard me talk about cycle syncing. And I def definitely didn't come up with this. I've followed women who have preached this for years as being something to live their life around and something that's transformed their hormone health. And I definitely agree with that. In previous years, I would have pushed through exercise and eaten the same thing every single day of the month and not taken into consideration that my body requires different nutrients, different food, different movement, different self-care throughout each phase of my cycle because there's actually four phases. So there's the menstrual cycle, which I'm on currently. So during your period, this can last three days, it can last seven days, but I like to split it into four weeks. So the menstrual week, the follicular phase, which is right after your period's finished, the ovulation phase, so when you release an egg, around mid-cycle, and then the luteal phase. So that's usually the week where people struggle with PMS. You can also link them to like being seasons of the year. So ovulation would be summer. So energy is going to be high during that point. Luteal phase is going to be like autumn. So we're winding down, coming to our period. Our menstrual week is going to be like winter. So things are dying down. So our hormones are at the lowest. We're feeling quite reclusive during this time. Maybe energy is a little bit low. And then the follicular phase is like spring. So our energy is rising again. Our hormones are being built. And you can see it just links perfectly with how nature works and how the female body is intimately connected with that. On my website, again, I have a blog post. I have a free guide on cycle syncing, which you can look for. I'll link all of this into the show notes. You don't need to follow it to a T. It's just a loose guideline. And if you don't have a menstrual cycle, you can actually sync with the moon because, like I mentioned, we're in sync with the moon. A lot of women ovulate with the full moon and menstruate with the new moon. So you can definitely start off and support your body by mimicking a natural cycle using the moon cycles. But like I said, there's so much information on this free guide that I offer and about the different foods to include because they do change throughout the phases of the cycle. And also, also self-care practices and exercise should be changed throughout the different weeks. Men are different. They can get away with the same exercise routine, the same diet, the same self-care because they, they, they run on a 24-hour cycle, whereas we are on a 28-day cycle. So their day-to-day -day life is pretty similar, whereas you've probably noticed one day at the gym, you're absolutely killing it, and another day you want to go home, you want to sit in bed and watch TV with a cup of tea. And that's completely natural to some point. Obviously, there's extremes where... If you don't want to leave the house because you're debilitating pain and you're feeling anxiety and really bad emotions, then that's probably a problem that we have to look into. But it's natural to feel energy fluctuations and mood fluctuations. Our personality actually changes and our brain function changes too. It's so interesting. That's why I love hormones so much. So there you go. They're my 10 steps to a better period. I hope you start to implement them. I know that a few of you are doing a lot of them already, but... I think there's a few recommendations and tips in there that you can get started with straight away. Again, our periods are meant to be easy, breezy. They're meant to come with no real problems. We're not meant to suffer. It's not a monthly curse. I absolutely love my period. And when I didn't have one, I just spent every single moment of the day researching on how I could get my period back. So when I see people taking pills or they don't get periods or they're happy because they don't have the periods, that's just a sign that they're not healthy and they're actually suppressing a really important message and report card from the body that can actually help them improve their health and future health too. So because I'm on my menstrual phase of my cycle, 
now that I've finished recording this, I'm going to go make a cup of tea, put on a face mask, read a book and chill out because my body's craving that and you should listen to your body and give it what it needs. And it's going to repay you back in terms of your next cycle being much healthier if you listen and respect your body's needs for this cycle. So that's all I've got time for this week. Next week, I'm joined by registered dietitian Lily Nichols and we're talking all about real food for pregnancy. I'm so excited for our interview to come out. Lily is a wealth of knowledge and her expertise is in real food, traditional foods, and moving away from the typical advice and dietary recommendations for women who are pregnant. I really think you're going to love that one. So make sure you subscribe if you haven't already so that you don't miss that episode. And if you love this episode, please leave me a rating and review as it really helps me grow my podcast. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Hormones in Harmony podcast. If you like this episode, please leave me a rating and review as this helps to spread the word to other women dealing with hormone imbalances. As a massive thank you gift, I'll send you a free guide, Six Steps to Hormonal Harmony. All you need to do is screenshot your rating and review, then email it to me at hormonesinharmony at gmail.com and I'll send you the link to download this free guide. If you haven't already, check out my website vivanaturalhealth.co.uk and Instagram page at Viva Natural Health for tons more free content and inspiration. You can also schedule a free 30-minute hormone troubleshooting call to find out the next step to take in order to overcome your symptoms naturally. See you back here next week for another episode. 